I'm going to speak to you on prevention of recurrent urinary tract infections using natural therapy. Um, this is something I really have a lot of experience in and working in the functional urology space. We see just so many UTIs in, in men and women. I think as urologists, we have a responsibility here to really you know, lead in this space, whether it's you directly or with some of your advanced practice providers. So I'm going to go over the AUA guidelines, which are excellent on this topic talk about antibiotic stewardship, and then help design individual patient-centered treatment plans that you can use in your practice. That's going to center a lot around natural therapy. Um, urinary tract infection is a huge problem, OK? Uh, a million admissions per year, $2 billion spent. 60% of women will experience a UTI in their lifetime. So this is a, a common problem. It's not going away. And it's something that uh, is something very concerning uh, in many practices. Uh, in women, younger women, it's a 30 to 1 ratio. So this is mostly a female problem, with the exception of neonates and, and the elderly. So what is a UTI? We're, we're urologists. We know this definition. I only bring this up so you remember the difference between a UTI and pyelonephritis. So this talk is not about pyelonephritis, it's about lower urinary tract infection. The pathogen typically is going to be E. coli. This was mentioned the other day. You guys remember this from medical school, the P. fimbria bind up the receptors on the epithelium. They lock in, and then the patient gets an infection. Glucose is a huge problem that I see in my practice when we do the dips. We see glucose very commonly. We see hemoglobin A1Cs over 10. So this is a spot where you really could you know, be a little bit of a primary care provider and talk about weight loss and better glucose control and urogenital hygiene. Um, the pathogens are almost always uh, E. coli, Proteus, or Klebsiella. Enterococcus are the ones we see in our community, but there are some regional variations based on your hospital um, that you're working at. The risk factors, it's pretty simple. For young women, it's almost always related to sexual intercourse. For older women, it's almost always related to estrogen deficiency. So think about those two things. The patient will often say, why am I getting this? What's changed in my life? What behavioral intervention can you make? Or what hormonal intervention can you make? Diabetes, I mentioned, is a big problem. So pay attention to that one. The diagnosis is pretty simple. We know, we know what this looks like. We know what pyelonephritis looks like. History, physical, urinalysis, it's not hard. Um, I often give patients dipsticks so they can um, test themselves. They can buy them now over the counter. This is very useful. Patient calls up and says, I think I have a UTI. It's Friday afternoon. You know, they want to have treatment. At least have them dipstick the urine so you can get a general idea. We want to get as much culture information as we can. It's not uncommon we get a referral for recurrent UTI, and there's not a single positive urine culture in the chart. Has anybody ever seen that problem? Yeah, all the time. And sometimes it's hard when you're working in different systems, and maybe there is culture data, but um, a good friend of mine, Ryan Terlecki, his wife, Terry, is an ER doctor. I asked her one day, why don't ER doctors ever get urine cultures? They only do dips. She said, well, um, we'd have to follow up on it. So, you know, in the ER, you want to really kind of treat and, and move on. You don't order tests. And so and people are getting all their care in the ER, urgent care, there's going to be no cultures. Um, Jen Anger, Una Lee, people you know have been at this meeting, wrote the guidelines. Um, this is very useful. So let's go through this. Um, most of the evidence is going to be level C. Um, through this problem. So urinalysis, urine culture, treat based on that. Statement number four, cystoscopy and upper tract imaging should not be routinely obtained. How many people do a cysto on every patient that gets referred to them for a UTI? How, how many people are selective? Yeah, and I think that's the right thing, it's C. So you, a lot of people want that, they're demanding that. They're looking for an answer. Maybe there, there's some, something that you're concerned. How many people do a workup with the CT and IVP and find nothing most of the time? Yeah, and so the more workup you do, the more expectation there's going to be 
that you are going to find something. Um, the Eurogen testing, um, I know some people uh, use this in their office. This is becoming more uh, available, and in select cases, we do use this. Um, so let's get into sort of the granular stuff. You know, how long do you treat? Who do you treat? Which antibiotic? These are the AUA guidelines, and I'm just going to walk you through what they tell us to do here. So strong evidence to not treat asymptomatic bacteria. I think we all spend time educating or referring doctors on this and patients. Um, you really have to stand strong on that because people want treatment, and you can treat them, but you don't need to treat them with antibiotics. You go through your evaluation, you're going to get a urine, you're going to get a culture, um, and then you're going to go ahead and treat. So how long do we treat, and what do we treat with? These are the three drugs we treat with these days. The trend is to treat for a shorter duration. Nitrofurantoin, five days. Bactrim, three days. Phosphomycin, one day. How many people use phosphomycin? Yeah, this is extremely useful. Um, you can call up your lab, ask them to run sensitivities for this. They will do this for E. coli. They won't do it for every organism, but if it looks like you're going to have to go to IV therapy, this is a spot you can have them test and maybe use single-dose phosphomycin. Um, so let's talk about guideline number 10, what to do with the recurrent patient. And I think those are the referrals that we see. You want something that has low allergy potential, rare adverse events, infrequent dosing, and something that's going to be affordable. Um, I like to use TMP sulfur. Sometimes I just use straight up TMP, 100 milligrams, no interactions, very well tolerate it. Nitrofurantoin I'll use in women especially, 50 to 100 milligrams, doesn't prevent Pseudomonas or Proteus, so look at what maybe UTIs they've had recently. Phosphomycin, I see my infectious disease colleagues doing this once a week. So maybe a patient who has a chronic catheter, who's getting recurrent pilo, and then up in the hospital, this is often where they go. One dose a week, phosphomycin. What about fluoroquinolones? Um, I'm using way less fluoroquinolones than I've had you know, in years because of the black box warning. You only need to have one patient in your practice that has really severe plantar fasciitis or acute Achilles tendon rupture, and you'll use less fluoroquinolones. How many people have had a patient that has had a side effect from fluoroquinolone? Yeah. And Dr. Brantz there gave his legal talk, and I would argue that if you had other antibiotics you could have chosen, you maybe had some medical legal risk. So what about the suppression? Um, what is the definition of recurrent UTI? People get referred for that. It's two in six months, three in a year, non-complicated. Options for if it's definitely related to intercourse, postcoital is the simplest thing that you can do. Um, or you can put them on suppressive therapy. I prefer methanamine, which is uh, Hiprex. So let's look at this. If anybody wants to take a picture of this slide, this is really simple stuff to do. Um, intermittent prophylaxis or continuous prophylaxis. This works, okay, and try to find inexpensive antibiotics that have low allergy potential and that have very few GI side effects. Um, what about long-term prophylactis? Trimethoprim generally is going to work. Sometimes I'll get on a rotation. Trimethoprim for three months, nitrofurantonin for three months, and then I will do uh, tri uh, methanamine for three months and then start back over. This is what I'm excited about is more the natural therapies. In Colorado, we have a lot of people that really want to embrace natural therapy, organic therapies. They really don't want antibiotics. They don't want multi-drug resistant organisms, the GI side effect, the yeast infections, and everything that goes along with chronic antibiotic usage. So water, right? This is really basic. Drink more water. Drinking as much as two liters of water a day will decrease your UTI risk by 50%. That's a big difference, right? That's about what a daily antibiotic would do. Um, people that have fecal incontinence, I recommend a bidet, and uh, patients will put this in their home bathroom, and this really helps quite a bit. And then a detachable shower head, and uh, they can shower before and after sexual intercourse. This works really well. So, I mean, this is 
really easy stuff that we can do, we can recommend. Um, I don't work for this company. I don't speak for them. This is over the counter, really cheap stuff. The CME people asked that I block that out, but you find a product in your pharmacy that people can use to cleanse themselves. This product comes in a pack. There's wipes and there's foam. It works extremely well. Um, anybody want to guess how many baths a patient in a nursing home gets per week? One. One. Okay, so at least on the other days, they can wipe down with these urogenital wipes. This is what happens in the hospital. Wipe the catheters down, wipe your suprapubic down. And then for younger patients, they can use this almost like a, a foam, like a spermicide foam. Put it on themselves, put it on their partner, uh, and then take a shower after having sexual intercourse. This will virtually eliminate recurrent UTIs in someone that's related to coitus. Cranberry, this came up the other day, cranberry. Pick the right cranberry. People say cranberry doesn't work. Yes, it does. Um, d manos doesn't work. d manos is not cranberry. Find the right cranberry, 36 milligrams a pack. The pack binds up the P. fimbria. The body washes it out. Um, there's no infection. 36 milligrams a pack is as effective as a daily dose antibiotic. This is where I have people start with. Um, this can be pricey. Some of these products are pricey, but it's worth it. And it's less expensive than going to urgent care. Um, lactobacillus and probiotics would be the third tier, right? Water, wipes, cranberry, probiotics. Those four things I talk about every day in the clinic. Methanamine, what does methanamine do? This basically creates a formaldehyde bomb in the bladder. You combine it with daily vitamin C, it's gonna work very well. You do wanna be cautious in people with renal disease. I have them dose this a gram every other day. And uh, methanamine really works. Methanamine's not an antibiotic, it's just a salt. Okay, so it's very simple. So let's um, talk specifically about the female patient. And I think Katie touched on this quite a bit on the postmenopausal patient. I'm not going to repeat this, but I really believe estrogen is going to be the mainstay, and this is an important conversation to have with your older patients. Um, this is another algorithm um, from urogynecology that I find really useful. If you get down to the bottom here, this is where I spend most of my conversation, right here. Lifestyle changes, modify the risk, cranberry vitamin C, vitamin D, and then eventually methanamine and probiotics. This creates a lot of distress. How many people have had difficult conversation with a patient in their office about recurrent UTIs? Yeah, and it's five o'clock on Friday. People want treatment because they feel no one's taking them serious. Nobody's listening. Nobody's doing anything. And I, I hear that all the time. So I, I think this is something where you can really make a big impact. The New York Times actually wrote about this recently. What happens in menopause? Well, the estrogen levels fall, lactobacillus fail to grow, pH drops, here comes the infection. Um, so perimenopausal patients, postmenopausal, it's gonna center around estrogen. Um, I'm gonna skip through this because it's been spoken to. Postcodal therapy we covered. And then the imitators, okay? The imitators are really important. So if it's not a UTI, and I say to patients, when you're having these episodes, I try not to say when you have a UTI, when you have these episodes, if I'm thinking it might be something else, tell me what's going on. Well, I have an infection. I understand that, but tell me what the symptoms are. What other diagnoses can we consider? It's gonna be GSM, OAB, IC, or one of these other things. Think about it, work up patients that do need a workup, but the more workup you do, the higher the expectation gets. So in conclusion, urinary culture is necessary for a diagnosis, treatment, prevention. Cystoscopy, upper tract imaging, rarely indicated. I rarely do it. Um, UTI therapy should be for the shortest duration possible. Methanamine is as effective as nitrofurantoin. Um, in cranberry prophylaxis, 36 milligram 
pack is as effective as antibiotic. Your goal is to decrease the UTIs. Someone will call me up six months later and say, you know, none of this is working. Well, what happened? I got a UTI. Okay. How many did you get last year? Well, every month. This year, one or two. It's working. We're going to decrease it. We may not eliminate it. Um, just a little plug here on functional urology. We're having our meeting uh, in August. Um, I hope people can attend. We have a full day on functional stuff. It's a good opportunity to learn more.